So our objectives in undertaking this review were to define what is long segment Hirschsprung disease, because I think the nomenclature is uh, really mixed, uh, to try and understand what are the preferred methods uh, for repair of uh, this disease, uh, and then to try and appreciate the long-term outcomes for, our, uh, for patients with long segment Hirschsprung disease, and try and describe any novel techniques or future strategies for treatment uh, that we may be, may be able to apply to our patients. Uh, so we conducted a PRISMA review. I won't go through the levels of evidence because uh, the prior group already summarized that. But we looked at the literature from 1990 uh, uh, forward, and uh, we defined four questions that align with our learning objectives. The first is really what is the definition of long segment Hirschsprung disease and how is it best determined? Uh, so uh, for the first audience response question, uh, the question is what is your definition of long segment Hirschsprung disease? Uh, is it proximal to the sigmoid and rectal sigmoid up to the cecum, uh, but not including total uh, colonic aganglionosis? Is it proximal to the splenic flexure up to the cecum and not including total colonic? Is it total colonic or beyond? Is it proximal to the rectal sigmoid, uh, but including total colonic? Proximal to the splenic flexure and including total colonic? Or is it something else? And I encourage people to come to the uh, microphone at the end. Uh, so please vote. I'm curious. All right. So, it's, so most people say it's proximal to the splenic fracture, including total colonic aganglionosis. Let's see if they're right. So according to the literature, uh, there, we found uh, 33 studies that defined this well uh, in, uh, in their approach. So uh, as you see them left to right, there were 22 studies that defined it as proximal to, proximal to the sigmoid uh, or rectosigmoid. Uh, there were three that defined it as proximal to the splenic flexure. Uh, and then there were eight uh, that defined it based on specific anatomic location, meaning they said, you know, transverse colon or hepatic flexure or ascending colon. Okay? And so our recommendation from this is that we use the term long segment colonic, uh, so not just long segment, but long segment colonic Hirschsprung disease is defined as aganglionosis that is proximal to the sigmoid colon uh, and descending colon junction up to the cecum with ganglion cells present in the colon. So the next uh, question is, does long segment Hirschsprung include total colonic aganglionosis? Again, there were 25 studies that uh, addressed this. Four of them included total colonic in long segment, quote unquote, and 21 did not, uh, so they broke it out separately. Uh, so our recommendation is actually that total colonic is defined as no ganglion cells in the colon, uh, but present in the terminal ileum, and that long segment colonic Hirschsprung disease does not include total colonic aganglionosis. Does total colonic aganglionosis include intestinal involvement? Uh, so again, 21 studies, 16 uh, of them had total colonic including intestinal involvement, and five did not. And our recommendation from these studies is that total colonic does not include intestinal involvement beyond uh, about five centimeters of the intestine, again, based on the literature. And that intestinal involvement beyond the terminal ileum should be called intestinal Hirschsprung disease. And total intestinal is defined as less than 20 centimeters of ganglionated intestine beyond the ligament artrites. We aggregated all of the studies that had details, so 22 studies, 2,350 patients, uh, and looked at what length of disease did those studies include. Uh, and so this is here uh, for your reference, but uh, about 75% of patients have short segment Hirschsprung disease, 15% have long segment, 8% have total colonic, and uh, just over 1% have total intestinal. This will be in the manuscript. So we propose, a, and this is a grade C recommendation, uh, two options. So the first is we abandon ultra-short segment uh, as a term because there's no clear definition. It's highly variable in the literature, and we say we should abandon the usage. Short segment should be aganglionosis up to the sigmoid colon descending colon junction. Long segment colonic is aganglionosis from the sigmoid colon descending colon junction up to the cecum, but with ganglion cells present in the colon. Total colonic is aganglionosis of the entire colon and less than five centimeters of the terminal ileum. Intestinal extends into the uh, terminal ileum and beyond uh, more than five centimeters, and total intestinal is less than 20 centimeters of ganglion intestine. However, we uh, think, uh, based on our committee's review as well as consultation with the Hirschsprung Disease Interest Group and many experts in the field, that we should really, as a group, uh, as a specialty, move towards pre precise specification of anatomic location, meaning rather than calling it total clonic or long segment clonic, 
really say where are the ganglion cells, uh, rectum, sigmoid, descending, etc. And so with that, second audience response question, uh, which would you prefer and which would you use? The, the first, which is uh, the segment-based uh, definition, or would you prefer to use a precise anatomic specification or something else? Please vote. Fantastic. We agree. All right. So then the next question becomes, how, how do we best determine that there's long segment Hirschsprung disease preoperatively? Uh, so this is uh, not well addressed in literature. There are four studies that we came across, and there's a little bit of overlap. So there are some uh, subjective features uh, that radiologists may uh, identify on contrast enema. Uh, normal, normal appearing colon, that may be a feature, small or microcolon, meconium plug or a comma-shaped colon. Uh, and then flattened or uh, uh, hepatic or splenic flexures. Specifically, the rectosigmoid index, uh, as we all know, normal is greater than one, so the rectum is bigger than the sigmoid in diameter, and Hirschsprung disease uh, should be less than or equal to one. Uh, the rectosigmoid index uh, was not suggestive of Hirschsprung disease uh, in the two studies that uh, addressed it. Looking at the radiographic transition zone, uh, so one, if a radiographic transition zone is not seen immediately, consider uh, the study used uh, 24 or 48 hour delayed films uh, to try and identify a transition zone. So if the contrast enema shows a rectosigmoid uh, uh, transition zone, 90% of those patients will have short segment disease, but 10% of those patients will have long segment disease. Uh, none of them, uh, at least in this study, had total clonic. If the uh, contrast enema shows long segment, uh, uh, radiographic transition zone, uh, all of them will have uh, long segment disease, 71% long segment colonic and 29% total colonic. And if the contrast enema shows no radiographic transition zone, 75% of those patients will have short segment disease, 12% uh, will have long segment disease and 12.5% uh, will have total colonic agangliosis. And so from this we recommend that contrast enema should be obtained preoperatively. Uh, there are specific uh, features that may suggest total colonic uh, agangliosis. The rectosigmoid index is not of value in diagnosing long segment disease. Uh, that we should consider delayed films if the initial study is uh, quote unquote normal or fails to demonstrate a radiographic transition zone. And that, however, the radiographic transition zone poorly correlates with the length of aganglionosis in total colonic uh, and long segment disease. Uh, in addition, uh, and we'll uh, elaborate on this in the manuscript, uh, we suggest that laparoscopic or transumbilical biopsy should be obtained to confirm the level of agangliosis prior to uh, starting any anal dissection. Uh, and I think this was discussed uh, robustly uh, on Sunday's uh, colorectal session. So the next question then is, what's the preferred method? So we have the diagnosis. How do we fix this? How do we fix these children? So to survey the audience. What is your preferred method for surgical repair of long segment colonic Hirschsprung disease? Is it the Swenson operation, the Suave, uh, and choose whichever one is closest to what you actually do. Uh, do Hamel, uh, Martin procedure, Kimura procedure, uh, an ileal pouch anal anastomosis, a permanent uh, stoma, uh, or something else? And again, this is long segment colonic, not total colonic, or beyond. All right, so most would choose the Suave procedure, and uh, second is the Swenson. It's very interesting. How about for total colonic disease? Same choices, same list of operations. What would you choose? Can we switch to the audience response thing? There we go. All right. So uh, an even split between the uh, Martin, uh, or an ileal pouch anal anastomosis. Very interesting, or sorry, the Duhamel, or an ileal pouch anal anastomosis. All right, fantastic. Let's see what the literature says. So, 
We already listed the options after leveling and biopsy for long segment total colonic or intestinal disease, uh, primary uh, repair or leveling ostomy, uh, and there's a variety of techniques. The literature uh, is, again, vague. So there are 20 studies that we identified that clearly describe the level of egg inglionosis and the type of operation performed. All of them are retrospective case series. None of them have any control groups or study design that allows us to compare one operation to the next. Okay? Uh, we tried to aggregate some of the data. Uh, so on the left are the various techniques and the number of papers that address that technique and the number of patients included in the studies. Uh, and, and there's some uh, uh, findings with each of the specific techniques. Uh, so for uh, Duhamel, for example, many of the papers noted an in, uh, uh, incidence of incontinence, which is greater than 40%. Uh, however, this is not spe uh, specific to the Duhamel operation. Uh, for Martin's procedure of the left colon patch, uh, many papers uh, remarked that it was technically difficult compared to the Duhamel or Suave. Uh, and that there's the concern for long-term dilatation of the colon uh, colonic pouch requiring provisional surgery. Uh, the Suave and Swenson, the outcomes appeared similar to the Duhamel uh, operation, but stool uh, frequency uh, decreases after ileal uh, adaptation, which is a concern uh, leading into it. For the right colon pouch, uh, this is primarily used in uh, intestinal disease, and again, long-term dilatation, similar to the uh, Martin procedure, uh, requires provisional surgery. For an ileal anal, uh, with or without a pouch, uh, there's a defined uh, failure rate and need for revision. Uh, and then, of course, small bowel transplantation has been described for patients with total intestinal disease, uh, but this uh, appears to be rare because of advances in intestinal uh, rehabilitation. Uh, and again, it's only really appropriate for the total intestinal population. And so what is the preferred method? Uh, our recommendation that there's insufficient evidence to recommend a preferred method for uh, surgical repair of long segment disease, uh, and that we as a society uh, really should consider prospective studies comparing operative options based on relevant long-term outcomes. And so to speak about uh, what are those relevant long-term outcomes, uh, Dr. Kawaguchi. Thanks, Ash. Absolutely. So what are the long-term outcomes for patients with long segment Hirschsprung disease? And this is actually a fairly hard question to ask. So we identified 22 papers in the literature that stratified patients according to long segment, short segment, and total colonic A ganglionosis, but only 10 out of these 22 papers specifically identified outcomes for patients with long segment Hirschsprungs. Nine papers addressed patients with total colonic A ganglionosis, and 10 papers reported on quality of life for patients with Hirschsprung's disease, but out of these, only seven, pa seven papers specifically spoke about long segment. So the outcomes examined had variable definitions within the literature as well. Normal bowel movements were defined as no soiling and not requiring medications or enemas, constipation, straining, bowel movements less than three times per week, incomplete evacuation of stools, or needing medications to facilitate stools. Soiling and incontinence were commonly grouped together within the literature, and Hirschsprung's associated enterocolitis, we all know have a lot of definitions, but generally abdominal distension Diarrhea, emesis, blood in the stool, or explosive bowel movements were defined as enterocolitis. So looking at the summary of those 10 papers that specified long-term outcomes for patients with long segment disease, they were found to have increased soiling incontinence, but overall this improves with time, increased stool frequency in looser stools, which makes sense as they have less colon, and a higher rate of Hirschsprung's associated enterocolitis as well. Now, looking at total colonic egg ganglionosis, that was a little bit easier as there's nine papers that identified outcomes for patients with total colonic egg ganglionosis. And I know this is a busy slide, and we'll summarize it on the next slide, but I want to show that there's a lot of variety in how people choose to do surgeries for this, as well as a lot of uh, combination of soiling and incontinence in the literature. To summarize these nine papers, the Duomol was actually the most common Sur definitive surgical procedure for total colonic aganglionosis. However, a lot of these patients had multiple surgeries, and most often this was because they had an incorrect level of aganglionosis prior to their definitive surgery. Soiling and incontinence were common, as well as Hirschsprung's associated enterocolitis. The number of bowel movements day per day reported was anywhere from one to six. Generally, it was more as the patient was younger and then got less and less as the patient got into their adolescent and teenage years. 
Loose stools, however, in this population can be a very big problem, which leads to perianal excoriation and electrolyte problems and even nutritional dif difficulties. In, in some of those papers, up to 20% of those patients actually ended up with a permanent ostomy due to these problems. In terms of quality of life, there were 10 papers, and again, seven of those differentiated in between level of aganglionosis. And for quality of life outcomes, the majority of these papers did compare Hirschsprung's patients to normal age match controls. And in comparing them to normal age match controls, there was, for long segment, there was increased abdominal symptoms, increased incontinence, and an equal, but an equal rate of constipation. They did not compare short to long segment, though, in these papers. And then a psychosocial domain, more of an emotional and well-being, school performance, that there was an overall quality of life comparable for Hirschsprung's patients to controls. However, quality of life was directly related to patients having a lower score if they had incontinence problems. And since our patients with long segment disease have a higher rate of incontinence, they actually had lower overall quality of life scores. So in terms of long-term outcomes, it's difficult to determine through the literature because there's often not a separation between short and long segment uh, reported in the literature. For total colonic aganglionosis, there are increased rates of incontinence, Hirschsprung's associated enterocolitis, as well as a potential need for reoperations. And what I want to stress is that longitudinal follow-up for these patients is really needed because once patients have had their definitive surgery, they're not necessarily all well. A lot of these patients still have problems and need to be managed by someone who's familiar with, with Hirschsprung's disease. And then their next question, the last question was, what novel techniques exist what future, and what future strategies are being developed for the treatment of long segment Hirschsprung's disease? Unfortunately, there really aren't very many novel techniques. Basically, all the papers have used techniques that were already discussed. Um, we wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, the myectomy, myotomy, and transanal decompression were two techniques. So this is not a new technique, but I thought it brought warranted mention. This is first described by Dr. Ziegler in 1987 for patients who have intestinal aganglionosis, so a very short segment of ganglionated bowel. It involves a uh, myotomy of about 10 centimeters of a one centimeter strip of bowel, and then a, uh, sorry, a myectomy of one centimeter strip of bowel, and then a myotomy along the anti-mesenteric border of the aganglionic bowel, and that can be brought up as an ostomy. While patients, some patients did have improved enteral uh, tolerance, and some people even get, got off of TPN. There were a lot of patients who had difficulties with sepsis due to intestinal bacteria and leakage, so it's not often done. And then one a preoperative thing that can be done, which I thought was interesting, is, uh, this is for patients with long segment Hirschsprungs or total colonic aganglionosis, this uh, study used a transanal De rectal decompression tube, which is actually done as an outpatient in these patients, and we're able to delay surgery for a mean of uh, 65 days, but anywhere from two weeks to four months, and then they did a definitive uh, surgical procedure, and these patients did very well with no upset of enterocolitis, no abdominal distension, and they did a uh, primary pull-through with no ostomy. Uh, one of the other things that has come up is, do probiotics help in the prevention of Hirschsprung's associate enterocolitis. There are two randomized control studies with 30 in each arm, and they compared uh, the use of probiotics versus a uh, placebo, and they had conflicting results. So the first study found a 24% rate of Hirschsprung's associate enterocolitis, and for both long segment and, Hirschsprung's disease, and short segment Hirschsprung's disease, it did not change the rate of enterocolitis. The paper by Wang et al. Uh, did show a, not only a decrease in Hirschsprung's enterocolitis, associated enterocolitis, but also a decrease in the severity and also a decrease in pro-inflammatory biomarkers and a decrease in anti-inflammatory biomarkers. And while they didn't specifically specify long segment or Hirschsprung's in this study, they did have equal amounts of long segment in each group. But I think the most exciting uh, novel treatment or up-and-coming treatment for uh, Hirschsprung's disease would be a cell-based therapy. So uh, using enteric, the potential for uh, cell-based therapy to generate an enteric nervous system in the aganglionic bell is one way that we could possibly treat Hirschsprung's disease. 
This can be done with uh, embryonic stem cells or IPS cells. Um, I know that there have been animal models that have actually worked and have been shown to be able to, repo or to generate an enteric nervous system. And I know that some uh, human studies are in the near future for this as well. This is being done by many of our APSA members who are listed here, and it's very exciting. So there is a lack of evidence to support any novel techniques, as there very, really aren't any in the literature. The emphasis should be placed in development of future strategies, such as cell-based therapy. Um, and these are just a summary of the sl our summary slides, but the basics are that we need to, I think Ash provided a very good definition of what we could use for uh, long segment versus short segment, but a preferred thing would be to use the anatomic location of the level of agangliosis. There is no specific surgical procedure that works best for Hirschsprung's disease, for long segment Hirschsprung's disease. I think the most important thing in the long-term outcomes is that these patients do need longitudinal follow-up because they do have issues with incontinence and enterocolitis. And that uh, although there are no new surgical techniques, it's very exciting, hopeful developments in the cell-based therapy for Hirschsprung's disease. Yeah. I think you know, the, the key really is that the literature is so mixed uh, because the nomenclature is mixed. Uh, and if we as a group can agree on a definition, uh, then we can really advance the field. Uh, the APSA Hirschsprung Disease Interest Group uh, just published a uh, paper describing uh, synoptic reporting for surgery and pathology, which uh, hopefully will help us standardize our definitions. Uh, when we publish the manuscript related to this review, uh, that'll reinforce that. Uh, but you know, then we can start comparing apples to apples and really studying this longitudinally. And I think that some of the uh, research consortiums uh, that our society uh, has already started in you know, the Midwest Pediatric Surgical, the Peds Surgical SRC, uh, the Peds Colorectal and Public Learning Consortium. Uh, these types of groups are going to be able to bring together uh, patients for a rare disease uh, around the world and help us uh, define how to care for these uh, children better.